Appreciate Brother Weeks teaching the Sunday school lesson this morning. He'll be teaching the next two weeks to the adults in the auditorium. And then uh, Brother Lamb will take about four weeks in the auditorium. We'll appreciate that so much as well. I know you'll be blessed. And then maybe by then we'll be dividing the adult Sunday school uh, uh, classes up to the classes that they were before. Uh, We'll just have to see what happens. Remember, being flexible is a key during this time. And you've been that. You've really gone through it well. And I praise the Lord for it. Turn to uh, the book of Mark, chapter 5. The book of Mark, chapter 5. I want to read a number of scriptures here to get us started today. We have a tremendous story in chapter 5 that we could preach all parts of the story, but I want to focus on one particular part, one particular truth, and allow that to uh, deal with our hearts. Notice the scripture says, beginning in verse 1, and they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that, he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country, Now there was uh, there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us unto the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Let me see if I can read that again and it makes sense to you. Think about it. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. You know, there are a lot of people out there all around Madison, Alabama, that the thought of going to a Bible preaching church that stands upon it, that it might make them calm down clothed and in their right mind and it scares them to death i mean really the things of the world that ruin their lives ruin their homes ruin their marriages that's the norm and they feel comfortable with that but going to a place that preaches thus saith the lord i mean preaching the message that has taken drunkards and made them sober taken harlots and whoremongers and made them pure and moral and right. It scares them to death. Think about that. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray pray him to depart out of their coast. Go over to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Notice beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were, you might underline that word were, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved. Now go over to chapter 4 of the same book. Notice verses 17 and 18. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I plead again today that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit of God. That as I preach, your word would go forth in power. If there's any here without Christ, may they clearly see their need for the Son of God. That only Jesus Christ can give them what they need. Only Jesus Christ can and will save them. And I pray that there would be sinners come to the Savior today. I pray for believers today. May we understand the work that Christ does in those who truly get born again. Have your way in every heart, every life. And Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading an article a while back where the writer of the article, and it's not important for me to give his name, said that Jesus came for the blind, the deaf, the lame, the hurting. Now, that's true. And we do not discount that, that he did come. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to save everybody. But the part that was missing in the article was that it, he came for them, and then that's kind of the end. He came for them, and not to change anything, not to really... Uh, yeah, he came for them because they had a need but didn't expect any more out of them. Now, when these people that I just mentioned, the blind, the deaf, the lame, the hurting, when they were touched by Jesus, they left different. They were not the same. The blind wasn't blind any longer. The deaf weren't deaf anymore. The lame weren't lame any longer. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of silly for here's... Here's a lame man. I'm kind of lame today. I'm down on my back some. That's why the chair's there. Uh, we'll see if I have to use it. But here's, here's a man. He's lame. He's dragging his foot. He comes up to Jesus. Jesus heals him. And he leaves. Still dragging his foot. Does that make a bit of sense to anybody? Or the blind being led by somebody up to Jesus... And Jesus heals him, and he says, hey, who's going to help me now? Somebody grab my hand and lead me. You would expect him to leave like a seeing person. If Jesus really healed him, isn't that correct? Hey, you don't need somebody to grab your hand anymore. Come on, you're expected. You can see. It would be expected. And I doubt there ever was a blind man healed by Jesus. That had to be led away. I doubt that there was ever a lame man healed by Jesus that had to get the crutch or have some people carry him. When the man was let down by his four friends, you know, through the roof in the one house, and Jesus healed that man, those guys didn't have to pick him up and carry him off. They left different than what they were when they got to Jesus. Now, in the first passage that we read in Mark chapter 5, we read about a demoniac of Gadara or the Gadarenes. Everybody was afraid of that man. He was a wild man. He got into all kinds of things thanks to the demons and all of that. But then when he was clothed and in his right man, mind, everybody was afraid of Jesus. And they asked Jesus to leave. I mean, what is he starting? A new cult of healed people? 
people who are in their right mind. I'm going to tell you now, there are a lot of folks around, they're scared to death of somebody in their right mind. So Jesus, you need to leave. We don't want Jesus because, you see, he puts people in their right mind. We have so many people living in a virtual reality world that they don't know what real living really is. You know, there's a false teaching among many today that you can be saved without a changed lifestyle. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You can change your lifestyle all day long and still die and go to hell. But I got news for you. You get saved, you come to Jesus, you leave different than what you came. Back in 1971, here I was brought up in a home of drinking and cursing, and the only time that I heard the name Jesus growing up was as a curse word. When I trusted Christ as my Savior in the fall of 1971, 22 years of age, God saved me, and I left different than what I was when I came to him. Brother Walt Smith and I have talked about that a lot. We have a lot of things that are very similar in our testimony. Now, he was not a radio disc jockey, although I guess he did work at putting in sound system at different places, so maybe he partially qualifies. I'm not really sure. But, you know, he had been in the Navy for a while and, of course, met Jackie and, and all of that, and uh, they got married. Well, he got saved, and guess what? He was different. Amen. He went off to Bible college. They didn't know anything about the school, not much to buy about the school, and they went off. I didn't know much about the same school, and we went off. We were married and had a child. We just went off. I mean, a lot of his test. it's like he listened to my testimony and tried to copy it without being the same. But I don't have any doubt that he's telling the truth about it. I mean, the Bible simply says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When I was reading this verse, I was thinking about that. Reading this passage, I was thinking about that. The difference after a person gets saved. It's not a matter of changing your life in order to get saved, but a changed life is the product of getting saved. By the way, the difference is as important as heaven and hell. If you're just trying to change your life thinking somehow that will make you better and you'll go to heaven, you'll still die and go to hell because the only way you get saved is through Jesus Christ. And he came into the world to save sinners, thank God. When he saves the sinners, bless God, they live differently. Now, I've got a two-point message, but don't get excited. It'll be as long as the rest of the messages that I preach. First of all, I want to look at some examples. First of all, we look at this example, the one of the demoniac, clothed and in his right mind and with Jesus. Now, what would make him want to stay with Jesus? He'd been hanging out in the tombs. Do you realize he had the freedom to go any place he wanted to go? And he chose to stay with Jesus and to be seated with Jesus. That was his desire. But he couldn't cuss around Jesus. He couldn't go around cutting himself around Jesus. He couldn't do all the things that he was used to doing around Jesus. But he chose to stay with Jesus. Why? He meant Jesus. Jesus did something in him. What a difference it makes. Why go back to the tombs? He's got no reason to be in the tombs. Now it's going to be a while before the people are going to accept him in his right mind. They've only known this man crazy. And they're going to be wondering for a while, when is he going to snap again? I mean, the truth is, if you didn't get saved till you were an adult, there were some people, when they found out you got born again, they said, well, let's just wait and see how long it lasts. And when they found that it kept lasting and lasting and lasting, now they're used to you being saved. And now they can handle it a whole lot better. But it scares them a little bit. If this demoniac had left Jesus and gone back into the tombs, and doing the very things he was doing before, and hurting people, and running naked, no telling what was coming out of his mouth, he would have all said, well, Jesus didn't do much for him, did he? I'm just simply saying that our examples in the Scripture, and they are, pardon the term, legion, of people whose lives were changed by Jesus Christ. You got the demoniac. Turn over to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, you got the story of the impotent man that Jesus goes and meets. In John chapter 5, I want you to notice some things in this story. John chapter 5, first of all, we're going to start into the story. Let's go to verse 7. 
The impotent man answered him. Well, Jesus asked him in verse 6, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him, uh, and him that was cured, it is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Now this man had been going down to that, been taken down many, many days, many, many times to that pool of Bethesda. And at that pool of Bethesda, I mean, where he was at, evidently there were times, I, I read one of those commentaries where they said, Somebody started a story, it wasn't true. Well, Jesus doesn't refute the story. Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't say to him, man, that's stupid. What are you doing getting into the pool? What are you doing trying to get into the pool? Evidently, there was a testimony. An angel would trouble the water. The first one that stepped in the water would be made whole, whatever it was. But this man couldn't step. By the time he'd roll that way, somebody would already beat him to it. They've jumped in. They've cut in line, whatever, and they've been made whole. This man feels like, and he's, evidently he's got some kind of hope of being changed. He doesn't want to continue like he was. And so Jesus says, wilt thou be made whole? He gives an excuse for why he can't be made whole. So Jesus just makes him whole. says, now rise, take up your bed and walk. Well, don't expect me to walk. Man, I've not walked in years. I mean, well, if Jesus healed him... I mean, it would be an offense to say, listen, I can't pick up my bed. I've not carried that bed in years. Other people have carried that bed. Why should I have to carry my bed? Do you realize that after Jesus met him, this guy had some new responsibility? A responsibility that he didn't have before. He was to pick. Now, you say, what if he hadn't carried the bed? Well, then it would have stayed right there. Probably gotten arrested for littering. I don't know what they did to him back then. When that was happening, I'm just simply saying he was expected to leave differently than when he came. When Jesus saves people, he changes people. And they are expected to live the change. Now, I want that to sink in. Uh, listen, you receive the grace of God. He gives you eternal life. But now he expects you to live like a person who has received the grace of God. Amen. A different walk. Yes. So this impotent man is made well. He wasn't to walk with a limp anymore. No matter how much he'd been used to it. Matter of fact, there was absolutely no excuse for him to go to that pool again. He's taken care of. He's well. Uh, now, we don't know a whole lot about this man later on. The Bible doesn't tell us much. But I imagine he was expected to get a job and not beg. Saved by grace, but he couldn't live the beggar he was before. I mean, when you meet Jesus, he changes you. Wait, we're not done. Go to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, you've got a blind man. He had been blind all of his life. And the scripture says in John chapter 9, as Jesus says in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. But he said, I am he. So here's a blind man. His testimony was he sat and he begged. Past tense. After this, he doesn't sit and beg. After this, now he sees. Guess what? He's got some responsibility on him. Now, I wonder if he'd have went to the pool of Siloam and washed if he didn't want the responsibility of now having to take care of himself. 
You say, that'd be silly. Everybody would want to have the... Well, wait a second. There are a whole lot of folks. The reason that they don't want the salvation that we preach is because they know that they're going to be expected to be different. Now, it's amazing. When they get saved, I mean, when they really get saved, there's a change that they're glad for. And they're glad to be different. Like I said, I got saved in 1971. I thank God for the changes he made in me. I thank God that the very first change that he made in me was he cleaned up my foul mouth. I thank God that he made that difference. And boy, he had been working changes for an awful long time, continuing to change things in my life. You know, at 22 years of age, you can get a whole lot of things in your life you shouldn't have. It's amazing the mess that you can get into, but I got news for you. Jesus makes a change in your life. He does it here to the man that's born blind. As a matter of fact, this man that's born blind is called to give an account for what took place, what happened to him. And he stands up for what the Lord Jesus Christ did. The Jewish religious leaders who had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, they were trying to run Jesus down, and this guy would have none of it. He stands up for Jesus, and he says of him, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not one thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Amen. And you see, the difference in his life when Jesus came into his life. In Luke chapter 10, you don't need to know, uh, turn there, but you know the story of the ten lepers. When a person had leprosy in the Holy Land in the days of Jesus, they were required to stay apart, Uh, not just wear a mask. Matter of fact, if anybody started getting anywhere close to them at all, they had to put their hand over their mouth and they had to cry, leprosy, unclean, unclean. If they didn't do it and somebody got close to them, it could mean the death sentence for them. These people were social outcasts. And of course, as the leprosy progressed in their system, they became more and more disfigured. It was a horrible disease, an awful disease. But in Luke chapter 10, Jesus heals 10 lepers. Now, you know the story. One of them turns around and says, thank you. Now, Jesus told them all that they were to go to the chief priest And they were to present themselves. You see, according to the law, anybody that thought they might be healed of leprosy were to go to the chief priest. They were to be shut up for seven days to make sure that the leprosy had had been taken care of, that they were well. They weren't a leper any longer. And only after that could they then enter into society again. But now wait a second. One of them turned around and said, thank you. I got news for you. Even though the other nine did not, they were still healed. They were the same. But guess what they didn't have to do any longer? Unclean. Leprosy. Unclean. No, they could walk around the city. They didn't have to cover their mouth anymore. They didn't have to suffer the abuse that obviously well people would heap upon them with their words. Now they were expected to be a part of society again, that that their lives would be different and they could make something of their lives. Now here's this one man, he turns around and thanks Jesus for it. The others, just as healed, they went on. But guess what? Whether it be the Samaritan that turns around or the other nine, all of their lives were expected to be different. It had been really ridiculous for them to still hang out in the leper colony. Still ridiculous for them to cry out to people when they came close to them. Hey, I'm a leper. Stay away. Stay away. Because they would be pronounced unclean. There was no need for that. I'm just simply saying, when Jesus does a work in somebody's life, there is a great change that automatically takes place. Not only that, what about Lazarus in John chapter 11? You know the story. Lazarus has died. Jesus comes on the scene. Now both of his sisters come to Jesus and they both say, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. Which tells me, of course, and you've heard me say this many times, they'd been talking to one another for a while. For them to say exactly the same thing at two different times, you know they didn't have to get this from the Jewish leaders that were out there. But regardless of that, these two people, even though they had been disappointed 
that Jesus came, got there after Lazarus had been dead for four days, they didn't stop trusting him. Now, boy, there's a message right there. I mean, right there in the message, maybe God doesn't answer your prayer the way you want it, but God knows exactly what he's doing. That's what that song was about we just heard. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's always right. And as I said the other day, if Lazarus had not died, they couldn't have seen a resurrection because there's only a resurrection for dead people. Thank God he rose from the dead. But now wait a second. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes out, but there's a problem. He's still in the grave clothes. Now, I believe God had taken care of all the decay. I believe the stink was gone unless there was stink in the grave clothes. But Jesus tells the people around him that you're to take that away. Wouldn't it have been dumb for Lazarus to go back into the grave and lay down? You know, the sun's not too bright in my eyes in there. Uh, that's where I'm going to live. I'm going to live in that grave. No, no, man. It, you're alive. You're alive. You can go back to the household now. A great change has been made. You've got to admit Amen. there's a great change from going from death to life. Amen. As a matter of fact, in the passage that we read in Ephesians chapter 2... Notice he says in verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That word quickened means made alive. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked, past tense, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh. Notice all this in the past. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Now, notice the first part of the next verse. And hath raised us up together. We're not in the grave any longer. We're alive. And now we have the responsibility as living people to live like it. I'm just simply saying, We've got several scriptures that tell us and several people that met Jesus and when they met him, their lives were changed because of it. You say, what's the principle here? You've been made alive to things you weren't before, so now live like it. Go to verse 17 of chapter 4. 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. I'm a Gentile. Most of you are Gentiles. All right, there might be some here with some Jewish blood in you, but most of you are Gentiles. He said, don't walk like it. We're not to walk like what the lost Gentiles walk. We're to walk like saved people. Amen. We are different. We are saved. We're going to heaven. Now let me go back to it. How do normal Gentiles walk? Look there in verse 17 again. In the vanity of their mind. Vanity. He goes on to say, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, that is my testimony. For 22 years, I walked according to the blindness of my heart. I didn't know God, but when I met Jesus Christ and he saved my soul, the Holy Spirit of God came to live within. It is absolutely ludicrous and unscriptural to believe that that Gentile that just got born again and has the Holy Spirit of God living within them, to go back out and live exactly like they did before. It ought never happen. Amen. That gets me a little excited. Praise God. <laughs> Notice he goes on to say in verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. 
If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the, what? New man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, if I'm not a new man, then that means I didn't get it. Right. You understand? If you're not a new person since you got saved, you didn't get it. Because this is a Bible truth for every Gentile that gets born again. And by the way, it's true of Jews too. When they get born again. But you see, well, why is he making a difference here between the Jew and the Gentile? Because the Jews have had God's word for a long time. I just found God's word when I got born again at the age of 22. And I had the Holy Spirit of God living within me when I trusted Christ as Savior. He came to live within me. What know you not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Whew. Yes, I got saved by grace. But that salvation by grace changed me. I was once totally in darkness. But according to this, now I am a child of the light. I'm to live like it. You see, either you're a new creature or you're not. And if you're not a new creature... You need to get born again. It's pure and simple. There are things that we are not supposed to do. Look at chapter 5 of Ephesians, chapter 5. Notice he says, first of all, be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given, us, or given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But... Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Do you realize that there are certain things that ought never be said of a child of God? There are things that ought never once be named among us because... We belong to God. I didn't quit doing anything in order to get saved. But when I got saved, he made me a new creature that didn't do some things anymore. And he does that to everybody. Now, by the way, may I just say, that's biblical separation in a nutshell. Right. It is a product of true salvation. And we are to act like what we are. It's kind of like when God called Israel out for his own. There were things that he made very plain to Israel that they weren't to do anymore. Why? Because they were God's people now. They were God's people. And because they were God's people now, they weren't to do the things that they did before. Uh, pure and simple. Simply because of what they were. Because of who they belonged to. It's a consistent message throughout the scripture. So what are we learning? If you're saved, live like it. If you're saved, live like it. If you're not saved, then we'd be shocked if you live like it. But some people can carry on the fakeness for only so long. In action, you've got many lists. For instance, here in chapter 5 of Ephesians... Notice what he says in verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know. Now, do you believe that when God says you know something, that you're supposed to know it? He said, for this ye know. God says you know this. That you know this. This is something that is beyond debate. This is something that we just automatically know. He says to these people, these Christians, for this ye know, that no whoremonger, 
nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is, not was, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Well, if they don't have any inheritance, then were they saved? No. Because we know this about salvation. Once you get it, you can't lose it. Amen. You got it for good. Either it's eternal life or it's temporary life. And if you lost it, it was temporary. Which means you didn't have eternal life. You said temporary life. Everlasting life, eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, but as may as received into them, give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It says in John 5, 24, and they shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now, notice what he says next. He says in verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. There are some people who are trying to make it sound like grace releases you of all responsibility to live like you've got the salvation that you're supposed to have if you really got saved. Man, I'll tell you, those kind of people, don't let them deceive you with their words. They are liars, they are false teachers who probably don't even have salvation themselves. Because one of the things we learn over and over again when God saves people, he does it right. He's going to, when he saves us, man, there's, there's a change that takes place. You won't, <laughs> you won't have any question anymore whether you're male or female. You're not going to be the 15th transgender or whatever that may be or what they said in England that they come up with 71 different genders. Man, you're either male or female, period. That's it. End of story. That's the way it is. And by the way, it'll straighten up how you dress. Now, part of that is growth. Brother Tony, I remember the first time back in the early 90s I went to Uganda. And uh, back in the early 90s, you went to Uganda, practically all the women in Uganda wore very modest dresses or blouses and skirts. And, I mean, they were covered, nothing tight, anything like that. When I went back there a few years later, it was down to around 40 to 50% because the westernization through Hollywood and all that kind of stuff was degrading their whole society. Unfortunately, most people in this country have been degraded by Hollywood and taught paganism and hedonism instead of godly Christianity. As a result, you've got a lot of people that claim to be saved, but hey, I got news for you. When that demoniac was going through the graveyard, I don't care how long he was in there, he knew the difference between being in the graveyard cutting himself and being at the feet of Jesus. He met Christ and he made a decision. He chose to be with him. We've just gone from a culture that one time at least respected the morals of the Bible to some degree to where there's no respect whatsoever. I'm simply saying if we're really Christians, the born-again variety, our actions should be different. I read an illustration by Dr. Lee Robertson, who's been in glory now for a few years, told the story of a Christian man who had a business in a downtown section of a city where there were many other offices, including some medical offices. This man did not have a medical thing, but he had a real nice open office where people would come in, they'd get a seat on a couple of couches there that he had in the office and so on. He was back in the back room, and he heard a great commotion, pounding on the walls and uh, screaming and crying, just carrying on. He came out of the inner part of his office into the outer part in the hall. He saw that there was a woman that was being led out of a doctor's office. What had happened, her husband had gone into that office for just a minor operation. They gave him some anesthetic, and unfortunately, the man had a reaction, a very strong reaction to it, and he died. And this woman, obviously his wife, I mean, she was just hysterical. And they brought her into this man's office and they, they laid her down there on the couch. She would not be consoled and she just, in weeping and wailing, carrying on. Well, the man came over to her and he bent down and in a low voice, he first offered his condolences to her. And then he said to her, are you a Christian? She stopped. 
she looked up at him. She said, yes, I am. He said, well, be one right now. And it was like there was a slap in the face. Remember those old Aqua Velva commercials? <laughs> Thanks, I needed that. I got to learn not to do that anymore. <laughs> she got up and went back into the doctor's office and gave directions as to what to do. And they say that she had a good godly testimony from then out. Now, that's not to say we don't sorrow when a loved one dies, but we sorrow not even as others which have no hope, the scripture says. Our attitude is different. When I read that story, I thought, what a statement. Well, be one right now. Do you know what the world's always known? They've known that Christians are to have a different walk, a different lifestyle, a different speech than the world. Even when I was brought up in a lost home of drinking and cursing and being brought up at the Eagles and the Moose and the VFW and the bowling alley and all that, I knew one thing about Christians. They were to be different. And if I saw somebody who claimed to be a Christian, I didn't know what saved was back then, but they claimed to be a Christian. If they were living like me, there was something false about them. I didn't trust them. And may I say to you, dear friend, that the world today still expects you as a believer to be different than them. And why not? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, God places something in each individual when he gets saved. They know the Holy One. They have the word of God. They have the Holy Spirit of God living within them. And now we are to walk as children of light. Final scripture, turn over to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. In chapter 4, he talks about Christ coming back and catching us away. And then he says this, and he talks about that being a comfort. Verse 18, in chapter 5, notice verse 1, first of all, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you for yourselves, know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, now look at this, ye, brethren, are not... In darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. We are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Remember back in Ephesians, he said, you were darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Here again to the Thessalonians, he says, ye are all the children of light. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Children of light, live like it. Can you trust a person who says they're a, child of light, but they're walking in darkness all the time. Does that even make sense? We wouldn't expect this demoniac to go back into the graves. We wouldn't expect Lazarus to keep the grave clothes on and sleep that night in the graveyard instead of being at home. We wouldn't expect the lepers to still be out there milling with other lepers. Now that they're clean, we expect them to be different For those of us who become children of the light, we're not to walk in darkness. We are children of the light. Let's live like it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, deal with hearts today. This is such a simple truth. I don't believe it's even a profound truth. It's an expected truth that we see throughout the scripture. 
Thank God your salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons we're different is you make us new creatures when you save us. God help us, Jew or Gentile, to live like the one who is the light of the world has come to live within us. There's one here without Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. I pray that they'd see their sinfulness and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I pray for believers today. We have allowed culture to lie to us, that tell us somehow our culture sits in judgment on the Scripture instead of the Scripture sits in culture or sits in judgment in the culture. God, please deal with our hearts today. May we get right with you that we have a walk as children of light. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in every heart and every life, for we plead it in Jesus' name.